I am delighted to be here uh, in Albuquerque. And you know, just a quick story. Um, my road trips to Albuquerque was up the I-25 corridor when the miners would play the Lobos. And uh, needless to say, every time I was going back, it was usually a sad story because nine times out of 10, we'd lose. But um, I still root for the Lobos. And uh, anyway, so it's fantastic to be in Albuquerque where you have such a remarkable um, legacy of rich history uh, and, and culture. So uh, I also feel like instead of being the expert on libraries and literary arts, I've become the expert in culinary arts because it seems like every other hour we're eating somewhere <laughs> differently uh, and thoroughly enjoying uh, my experience. So um, I appreciate uh, the introduction from Dennis, uh, my colleague. Uh, we were also earlier having a conversation with Betty Silva, the director of the uh, cultural arts, and it was really interesting how she said, you know, the library is one of the star departments. So I hope that in some of the conversations that I have with you and, and some of the ideas and recommendations will not only position the library to continue being a star, but also to sort of rise above and, and lead the galaxy in terms of transforming the downtown district. So um, also, you know, Dennis commented about the, the conversations on culture, uh, conversations about different stakeholders, which I think is amazing that a city would open itself up to say, you know, we know we have some opportunities, some assets here, uh, but we also want to hear from folks externally because listening to different voices and being open to opportunity really will create a dynamic outcome with your cultural plan. So I commend you for that. Um, my role, you know, I'm excited and passionate about libraries. My experience of over 35 years in the library business. Uh, ranging from uh, starting as a middle school librarian in El Paso, Texas, my old middle school, uh, then moving on to Arizona, and then finally, uh, a lot of wonderful experiences in San Diego, Long Beach, Pasadena, and then finally in San Francisco over the last uh, several years, or about seven years to be exact. Um, and through that, I've seen libraries evolve, and my sense is that we're actually going through the most uh, amazing period of transformation for libraries for many reasons, uh, whether it's because of the technology revolution, uh, for the reason that there's so much more uh, demands on the services that a library provides. Uh, we all know that during this economic downturn, uh, libraries, uh, ironically, are heavily used. There's a tremendous resurgence of libraries. I know in our city, uh, in San Francisco, uh, there's about uh, 7 million visitors a year. Uh, we have uh, been borrowing about 12 million items each year. And all of that speaks to the, the demand for our public. Uh, whether you're career transitioning or looking for jobs, uh, it really is a, a, a new world out there. And libraries are definitely playing a key role in that. So um, also, you know, in, in 2010, there was a Harris poll that was conducted, and it gave some insights into the use of libraries throughout the nation. And let me give you a, a few statistics. 65% or two-thirds had visited their library in the past year. That's pretty amazing. Uh, that's about 219 million Americans visiting our libraries. About 94% agreed that libraries improve the quality of life of their community. And 87% agreed that it was important to education, while another resounding 83% felt that it was, excuse me, 79% felt that it was a source for cultural programs. So with those statistics, you can easily determine how uh, Americans and how our users see the connection to culture, arts, education, and all of those quality of life factors that are so important in our communities and to be vibrant communities. So today I'm gonna to focus on libraries and the connection with literary arts. Uh, what I know best right now certainly is the landscape in San Francisco. So a lot of the examples that I'm drawing from are about what we are doing to transform our library system into the life and blood of our city. A lot of the ideas may not be new to you uh, because you're doing some things here in Albuquerque, but I hope that also some of the ideas uh, will inspire you to try them out here, uh, to connect with partners, uh, and to focus on how you can get the Albu Albuquerque Bernalillo system uh, as one of the top libraries in, in the nation. So I talked about the San Francisco Public Library. What you're looking at on the screen is the atrium. And I mentioned the, the high use. It's in a civic center area, which is a pretty challenging area of our city government center. 
Uh, we have, uh, I mentioned seven million, but on a given day, you have thousands of people walking through this, this main library. Um, we are also experiencing one of the, not one, the largest capital improvement program in the history of the library. It calls for uh, 16 renovations in libraries and eight new library buildings. So I've been very fortunate to be there during the openings of the 22 out of the 24 projects and completed that. So that's a feather to the community's cap. And I'm also going to be talking about the impact that that's had in community building in our regular in our uh, various neighborhoods. One of the things that we're also uh, doing in San Francisco, which I would urge that, that you do in Albuquerque, is to focus on what you do best and not to uh, spread yourselves thin because we have limited capacity and limited resources. We all know that, right? And libraries are, are good at being all things to all people, but that's not realistic and that's not really the, the, the best approach to the dollars that we have available. So in San Francisco, we really just focused on five areas. And I want to share those with you because some of them may resonate with what I understand you're working on in Albuquerque in terms of some brand clusters. So the areas are literacy and learning. Think about that. I tell our custodians, I tell our IT folks, our pages, our librarians, what you do every day is going to connect with literacy and learning. Your role, whether it's uh, cleaning our facilities or investing in collection development, it's about literacy and learning. The second one is about youth engagement. How do we get our next generation of advocates, of library supporters involved in, in libraries? So youth engagement and literacy, all of that is, is critical. Uh, third, the whole notion of the digital strategy, the digital environment. What an amazing opportunity with what's happening with uh, new technology, with e-media, uh, et cetera. And I know that that's one of the priorities that in Albuquerque certainly uh, can play a role in creating virtual communities, but also communities and uh, using social media and so forth. The uh, diversity in programming, what an amazing opportunity we have for serving targeted communities, multiple generations uh, in our city, and certainly it can be reflected in, in Albuquerque as well. Uh, and then the last piece, which I want to talk about uh, as well is on strategic partnerships. Um, I feel strongly that uh, partnering is in my DNA as the director of the library system and I would hope that I can inspire all staff to understand that we can no longer afford to be in silos, that it's all about networking and partnering. And librarians and library staff actually can do a really good job on that. So I hope that I can inspire you and, and talk about how we can do that. So today, the uh, sort of concepts are pretty basic and nothing earth shattering and they're easy to remember because we really are looking at four areas. Um, place, partnerships, programs, and people. Okay? And all of them come together uh, to create a sense that I think will help in your cultural plan. So in terms of the library as a place, I think it's really important to capitalize on your physical assets uh, your buildings, okay? But these buildings are not, are more than just bricks and mortar. They're buildings that are organic that become a destination for community, okay? In um, the various audiences that you see here, for example, uh, you see the children. Uh, when we talk about the library as a place, you look at out external communities for example, this one is early literacy, and you can see the bookmobile in the background. Okay? You also see the technology use, where folks are learning new media. Or the traditional, I want to read a book, I want to check out a book. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the library as a sense of place. It's also building community. Uh, perhaps more than any other agency in city government, number one, it's the most democratic institution that welcomes just about or not just about anybody, free, uh, but it also provides that safe and welcoming environment. So it's up to us to also create environments that, that really do focus on that. Here you see our, the same atrium that you saw from the top level um, that is the entryway for the main library. Here you see it as a place of civic dialogue and uh, civil discourse. Uh, for example, in, in the city of county of San Francisco, 
Uh, we've worked closely with the um, California Council for the Humanities to engage in a search for democracy project where we bring together uh, and facilitate conversations on a variety of topics that really do resonate in the community. It's also tied to the literary community by identifying five different books statewide, uh, similar to what you have in New Mexico in the Big Read, uh, but in this particular case, it focused on bringing together uh, the community uh, to literally select a book. It ranged from the Constitution to Farewell to Mansonar, a whole diversity of titles that, again, seek to have more conversation uh, in the community. The next focus is the library as a place for, for programming. Um, and let me begin here with this example as well uh, of our different spaces and different opportunities for celebration. Uh, on the far, on the bottom right hand side, you see Unsung Heroes. That's uh, from our Bayview neighborhood that is primarily African American community. Uh, and the library took the lead of creating this program when, where they would actually nominate community grassroots folks uh, and celebrate their accomplishments as community heroes. And then it's held at the main library, so it brings it into the Civic Center area uh, and it's a full house, 300 strong, really celebrating individual accomplishments. So that's one community building opportunity. Uh, the conference setting there uh, is a variety of staff and the public talking about what is it that inspires you in terms of uh, different, different uh, types of programs. And certainly going out into the community. That one represents a uh, community festival uh, San Francisco is notorious for having just about every neighborhood have a festival during the late summer and into uh, fall when it's less foggy and much more amenable to outdoor activities. But in terms of the uh, library as a place for programming, and I emphasize this, it's got to be aligned with your planning priorities. And, and this is where I think in terms of identifying whether it's youth engagement, whether it's literacy and learning, that the programs resonate and connect uh, with those activities. Again, here's a couple of examples. The um, lion dancers and the dragons here uh, are the opening of a, one of our neighborhood libraries. That's a tradition that we have where they actually lick the, the doors as we enter to um, make sure that we have good spirits entering, entering the library. And then the other piece about the programming is that we also don't reinvent the wheel. If something is working well and the funding is there, capitalize on that. So this is taken from Litquake, which is the non-traditional literary festival that takes place once a year in the city. And it says where literature hits the streets. Uh, literally, when we talk about a lit crawl, it's poetry and prose in different neighborhood pubs and bars. Um, independent bookstores uh, throughout the mission, throughout various neighborhoods. But what's amazing about this opportunity is that we partner with them to host quite a few other events uh, at the main library and some of the neighborhood libraries. So we don't pay a cent for this. It's literally just basically saying, we know that we have a network of authors and writers. Uh, we connect with the planners of Litquake and we continue to engage a very diverse audience. It's now moving into, I think it's 12th year. Uh, it's been replicated in New York, and I believe that Austin is gonna have its first lit crawl this summer. So it tells you that it's, it's a model that actually works. Um, the other focus now, we're gonna target the teen and young adult community. So now we're having teen crawl, which is the same kind of concept, but it's really in venues that are non-alcoholic and obviously uh, represent and, and target a different demographic. I know that uh, you've just announced your Poet Laureate, which is fantastic, uh, here in Albuquerque. Uh, that's one way of uh, elevating the role of the library in that literary arts community. In our city, uh, we are now into our sixth year of our One City, One Book uh, program. And let me tell you, uh, there's, there's two things that have given us the most visibility in the community. The One City, One Book, and our Branch Library Improvement Program, and, which I'll talk about later. But the One City, One Book, just to give you a sense of the actual impact in the community, uh, for this program alone, which was Mary Roach, uh, the author of Stiff, 
her title is Packing for Mars. It's a science-themed book where she actually interviewed astronauts, cosmonauts, and asked them the questions that we always wondered about space travel, like how do you endure not taking a shower for months uh, if you're in a space lab, or how to endure um, throwing up in weightlessness, all of that stuff. It absolutely engaged audiences. Uh, we had 600 uh, high school students in one of her visits to, to a neighborhood school. We had about 1,600 attendees at various programs, including a conversation with Adam Savage from Mythbusters. I don't know if you've seen that show. Um, but it was fantastic to have that back and forth uh, uh, with her. Um, all told, I mentioned 10,000 participants. And it also had an economic impact. Because while the library checked out about 3,500 books during the course of a couple of months, it actually sold 3,200 books. So think about what that does for the independent booksellers. Uh, every single title that's been selected becomes a number one, or at least in the top five, bestsellers in the San Francisco Chronicle. So that tells you that there is definitely an econ economic impact. It had 1,000 followers on Twitter and Facebook. So it goes beyond the just come to the library, but actually go out there and, and really create that um, literary community. A couple of other examples. Um, this, the Say Tune was Dave Eggers, who is a San Francisco uh, native and uh, the title was actually about Katrina, post-Katrina, uh, nonfiction title that also had a lot of social justice issues related to that. Uh, and then a much more lighter one, uh, which was called Alive in Necropolis. Uh, there, nobody's allowed to be buried in San Francisco, so there's a community south of the city called Colma, where everybody's buried. And so this was based on the historic characters in San Francisco coming alive out of that cemetery. So if you can imagine, we had a lot of fun with this one. Everything from the police detectives doing some work, and they actually designed a donut in one of the donut shops for, uh, to coincide with this. Uh, they had some readings in the cemeteries uh, at midnight. So just any opportunity to just have fun with, with literary arts uh, certainly makes, makes a difference. We target different communities. Uh, uh, Hummingbird's Daughter uh, by Luis Surrieta focused on the Latino community. We also had one that had an Asian, Chinese American theme. Uh, and uh, Cane River was genealogy uh, regarding the African American experience. So all of that really resonates. And again, you can't buy this sort of publicity. You have bus tails out there. You have um, uh, cup warmers and all sorts of marketing strategies associated with it. And I will never, never give up the one city, one story concept because it promotes reading, but at the same time, the library becomes the focal point of, of that community. But let's talk about other kind of audience engagement that transforms uh, the exterior, the outside of a, of a community. Here you have the Civic Center right outside the main library. Um, and this is called the Tricycle Music Fest West. It actually started in Charlotte, Mecklenburg Library, where they had their first kindy rock concerts at the library. Uh, so for us, we said, let's do it and call it Tricycle Music Fest West. And it's been a tremendous success in engaging youngsters in not only the music entertainment arena, uh, but what's wrong with having or taking over an entire outside of a neighborhood uh, and having all these rockers. Uh, we had amazing testimonials from families and children, what's, what, what not. Uh, one dad said, I had my child attend his first rock concert at the library. <laughs> what better testimonial, right? Um, and it worked. Just to give you a sense, we had over the last three years 9,300 children and families that have, have attended these music concerts um, at the library, including block parties, etc. The uh, beauty of this is that it also has a literacy component, certainly. It's not just about music, but we've engaged the uh, teachers and faculty at neighborhood schools, and we have a professional music development component that also trains librarians on how to use music and literacy. Uh, as the elements. Um, we've had speed dating at the library. I don't know how many of you read it in, in library literature, but it was just so much fun and we got so much media attention. We basically matched up folks based on their literary interest. And it was focused on baby boomers, and let me tell you, it was a hit. Because you would have five minutes to share your literary likes with someone and then you turn around and 
share with somebody else. And at the end of the session, if you like somebody, you would actually leave their name and contact information, email, and then we would do the contacting. We don't know whether there were any matchups or whatnot, but it was a hit. Okay, and then we had different target communities. We had LGBT one night, we had seniors another night, and so forth and so on. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that I, I love it because it came from one of our librarians that said, can we try this? And we said, sure, why not? Um, so the other example, oh, I needed to mention this because uh, I mentioned the, the role of partnering and leveraging dollars for this. So the Tricycle Music Fest included the Sunday streets. That's a big deal in the city of San Francisco. Once a month, they want to close a major thoroughfare uh, for Sunday and just make it pedestrian friendly with all sorts of activities. Well, the centerpiece in um, the Civic Center area was a library. They closed the streets in the area and made this entire uh, music celebration. But we also partnered with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, the First Five of San Francisco, which is a tobacco tax initiative to bring dollars for early literacy, um, the SF Unified School District, Jumpstart, a whole slew of nonprofits whose major focus is the shared mission of early literacy. So, what do we have here? Well, you know, the Friends of the Library are usually known as the, the kind of, we're gonna have um, cupcake sales. Uh, the demographic of Friends is usually older than it is a younger generation, but our Friends of the Library really wanna target that kind of hipster generation, the, the, the young um, professionals. So they started this program called Imbibe, and I can imagine that you know what Imbibe means, and that's exactly what these programs are about. They're after, after, after our mixers, cocktail hours, in our neighborhood branches. And so we've had a series of four uh, that have been amazingly successful because it's a happy hour at your neighborhood branch. Um, it includes an author or writer that'll talk, um, not while everybody's over indulged, but during a time when what they're saying actually resonates and makes sense. But it's been really, really a wonderful fundraiser and it's increased the membership of the younger generation of our Friends of the Library. So that's an example where I really think that they were very smart and uh, strategic in their marketing strategy. The San Francisco Friends also sponsored a very successful uh, San Francisco International Poetry Festival. Now this took some dollars and some um, individual donors that subsidized it so that we would bring in about 25 international poets from throughout the world, uh, whether it was Israel or, in fact, Palestine, um, the Middle East, et cetera, um, Italy, all over the world. And it was amazing to see their performance of poetry and prose uh, in an auditorium venue that really attracted at least 500 folks. And it was uh, a literary night to, to really remember. Uh, but again, it's, it's a very unique opportunity. And what I noticed in Albuquerque in the, in the short time that I've been here is that you have a very strong poet uh, guild uh, here in the downtown area. And they are willing partners uh, with the library uh, to not only do joint marketing, but to uh, use this venue, this is a wonderful space uh, in the main library, uh, to promote your collections, but also um, the literary arts. My next focus in terms of the, the um, strategic areas is about partnerships. And this is just a sampling of the types of partnerships that are opportunities waiting to happen for Albuquerque, but also many other public libraries, and in our case, uh, opportunities that have actually taken place. So I'm just gonna do a few shout outs and a few examples. Uh, when you look at the San Francisco environment, that's a city department that actually has paid for half of a full-time librarian to focus on helping market their services in the Department of the Environment and also what we do in our collections. Uh, we actually um, have a focused green stacks initiative in the library where we wanted to be the one-stop agency for information on uh, how to um, build green and sustainable buildings, uh, remodels, et cetera, programming, 
collections, resources, all of that through what we call a separate uh, icon or website in the library that's called Green Stacks. And again, it's been very successful. When you look at the San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department, uh, they were very much uh, in need of additional dollars because they're a general fund department. Our department is very fortunate to have a tax set aside. So during the economic downturn, they were getting some significant hits while we were doing okay. So our way of partnering with them is to literally um, put some dollars into their senior centers and uh, rec centers with the explicit goal and outcome of having literacy components in their after school camps. So now it's actually marketed as part of their summer camp uh, and, and we see it as a win. Even though we're, we're paying for it, it's their staff that's literally putting that literacy piece every time you have recreational activities. So that's a partnership that really uh, melds the recreation part with the education part. Uh, San Francisco Police Department, you see it up there. You see the San Francisco Department of Public Health. You say, well, how's the library partnering with those agencies? Well, the city of San Francisco has a significant homeless problem in the Civic Center area, uh, right where the library is. Uh, and so when I first started, the staff would tell me, if you can do anything, uh, help us deal with folks with mental health issues or the homeless community. And we don't have the skills, we're not social workers, but I knew that as a city family, we could address the concern. So working with the Department of Public Health, we actually paid for a full-time social worker to have an office and uh, be placed at the main library. And that person actually has met with phenomenal success of referring uh, at least 250 individuals a quarter uh, for housing, for social service er uh, support, uh, whatever the case is. But it's helping us change the image of that, that Civic Center uh, main library. Um, and again, we've gotten calls and interviews internationally with uh, Leah Esguera, who is a social worker. Uh, it's also provided some support for our uh, restroom facilities that were notorious for uh, drug havens. Uh, and through this, much more awareness and changing the image uh, through that partnership has really worked. The police department, I talked to the chief of police and I said, you know, we have a, a, a group of security personnel that want to do the right thing, but they don't have the professional skills. So could you lend us one of your personnel? So six years ago, they lent us a sergeant. We pay their salary, but professionalized our security personnel. They send them to our, the police academy for some training, uh, change the schedule, much more of uh, responsiveness to the whole area of public safety, which has to happen to be able to transform and, and feel like you have a welcoming environment. The Academy of Science, KQED, which is our public television station, and the Bay Area Video Coalition. Uh, recently, we were awarded a MacArthur Grant to begin uh, to plan for a digital learning media lab for young adults. So we're very excited about that because uh, young adults are learning differently using technology differently and we want to create a, a teen space, a teen center with an entire focus on not just the printed book uh, but also of content creation. So what better um, partners than folks that know about film editing, um, know the networks out there. The California Academy of Science has an amazing educational program uh, and the public television studio wants interns. They look at it as a career opportunity for future employees within their, their system. So one of the reasons we were one of 12 to get the grant, we were told, was the strength of the partnership. So it definitely makes a difference. And, and that's just uh, an idea. The Arts Commission, I, I need to mention that because we're so proud of that. And here you're under the umbrella of cultural arts, which is great because you're already working together. Uh, in our case, we uh, have a 50-50 proposition with the Arts Commission on what we call Writer's Corps. Writer's Corps is an at-risk um, writing program uh, that goes through different high schools and engages young people to literally for the first time put into a, a manuscript their poems, their um, thoughts, uh, and it's so powerful because once a year not only do we publish their work, 
It looks like a very professional manuscript, book, monograph. Uh, but also they perform in the auditorium. They actually do their poetry reading, etc. And it's one of the most powerful, riveting um, experiences that you'll see because it transforms individual. And so the relationship with the Arts Commission, it really is an arts commission and library program that we're extremely, extremely proud of. Uh, with the school district, a couple of quick things. Uh, we're uh, excited about always engaging the school district in not only uh, information competency instruction, but also in um, ha having youngsters excited about the library. So we mounted a library card campaign where teachers and um, our librarians and staff are working to ensure that every kindergarten student and every first grader has a library card. We do that by pushing the applications and having the teachers helping us, having contests so that uh, we give incentives to classrooms for the highest rate of participation. And our goal is to reach 100%. We're not there yet, but we're hoping that this creates youngsters to be library card car carrying individuals. Uh, the other program that we have with the district is to look at uh, um, principal in service. Uh, we found that it was hit or miss in getting uh, classroom visits to the library or even allowing our library staff to go into the schools because of safety concerns uh, to provide uh, story time or class visits, etc. So we decided to take a different approach and go straight to the superintendent who allowed us to have the principals come to the main library for a half day in service. And the in-service was to explain to them about the resources we have from homework help, um, databases, et cetera. And you should see the turnaround in terms of the number of class visits. We have teachers saying, well, our principal said we should come. And that's exactly the kind of approach that we want to see because word of mouth gets out there in terms of the engagement from the administrators. Um, and we also had a contest where we involved five uh, five different grade levels to design their own library card, and then we selected winners from each of the great grades, and now the public has a chance to pick a card that literally is from a different child, different grade, and different design. That's really taken ownership and given us uh, a wonderful um, involvement from the school district. Albuquerque also has something similar to what we have in the museum pass. This is a, a fantastic opportunity for families who can't afford the cost of different uh, museum excursions. So through the library, you can literally check out a pass to a whole slew of museums in the city, and it's free. So here's an example of the various uh, opportunities from the zoo to the Walt Disney Family Museum to the Contemporary Museum, the Asian Art Museum. Uh, we're at almost 90% uh, capacity of the number of passes that are available at your neighborhood branch or the main library on a weekly basis. So think about it, if it's a family of four or five, uh, it's a hundred bucks or so. And sometimes it's a, a barrier to actually have in this challenging economic times to be able to afford this. So this is a partnership that we're very proud of um, with the various museums. And it's subsidized by the museums, by the way. So they're the ones that are saying, for us it's a marketing strategy as well. Right? Um, and it's a, a, an investment in the community. So at the end of the day, it's about people. And, and I'm really high on, on um, ensuring that we can have programs, uh, we can have uh, a variety of partnerships, but the people that make it happen uh, is really where we determine success. And, and I believe that in the library business, the skill set that librarians have uh, make, make a heck of a difference. Uh, first of all, librarians and library staff have excellent facilitation skills. Uh, we are a resource in terms of being able to facilitate conversation. Uh, we network well. Uh, and, and many of us, if we look at being much more externally focused, uh, the community can tap into our pool. But at the same time, library staff understands how to tap into different external resources uh, and community expertise. So that's why I strongly believe that we have the talent and expertise. In San Francisco, we have about 60 different languages that are spoken by our staff, and we invariably get calls to help 
the city agencies in translation, uh, and uh, whether it's in, in print or whether it's just in communication, um, which is important. And certainly the technology expertise. Uh, as we're adapting to change, uh, we can navigate technology extremely well. Uh, and so I, I would offer that as you develop your cultural plan, uh, I, I say this to council people, to policymakers, make sure you engage the library, to have them at the table, because there really is a tremendous talent in terms of getting things done, uh, working collaboratively. That's the other thing. We have uh, kind of in our DNA the ability to share a network. That's what, what makes us tick. I want to talk a little bit about, oh, I love this photograph. This is a family uh, after a, a library opening, and they all are carrying their book bag with books, the dad, with the kids, um, and that's exactly the kind of role that we would love to see play out in each and every neighborhood. But let's talk a little bit about the value proposition, okay? Um, and, I, and I know that in, in looking at some of the studies that have already been uh, undertaken by uh, the department uh, here in Albuquerque, um, trying to put a value to what each of the various disciplines brings to the city is a challenge, but I think we're getting better at it. And I'm going to point to the benefit study done by the commissioned by the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library uh, in 2007. It's a little dated, but the message still resonates. So they took examples of, of reference service, databases, program space that's free, and put a variable of cost uh, how much would it cost? And what are the roles that, that the library actually plays in the city experience? So there were certain areas, for example, enriching their learning and recreation was a key element of it. There was also the importance of an enhancing an image and identity for San Francisco and its neighborhoods. This is so important because when we open a new library, uh, the sense of community and the pride of each neighborhood centers around the branch library as a community anchor. And I know we have some branch managers here that can echo that, that sentiment about how important it is. The same thing can apply with the main library here in the downtown area. It's got to have that, that sense of being the community anchor for the entire downtown district. Fostering economic and workforce development. Uh, we're taking the lead in the city with other uh, city departments when the mayor calls out for us to hire young people in the summer for opportunities, uh, training and jobs, uh, that's where we foster economic development. Uh, we want to create the future librarians, the future city librarians um, by, by investing in them early uh, and certainly the partnership for education and early literacy. So at the end of the day in our city for every dollar received the return was about $3.34. Now, you have to realize that it's a very expensive city. So in other jurisdictions, the return of investment is probably higher. In some cases, it could be $5 for every dollar invested. Think about that when you think about Albuquerque. I know that you, you face uh, funding challenges because it's a very different business model that you have, uh, but make the argument and message the fact that you know, for every dollar invested, you're going to see X number of dollars returned. Philadelphia was another example where they did a 2010 study, and they determined that uh, in terms of literacy, there were $22 million in return on investment for that city. In terms of business, it was $3.8 million because of um, small business investment or teaching them how to create small businesses. Um, there was workforce development total of six million. So when you combine that, that's close to $30 million of a return on investment in the city of Philadelphia. Seattle is a great example as well. When they built their new library, uh, an amazing design, uh, it became the number one tourist destination for years and years and years. And it really, I mean, you would have people from the airport on a taxi cab driving straight to the library, right? I mean, what better testimonial could you have in terms of transforming a neighborhood. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the Branch Library Improvement Program in our city because it really has created this amazing awareness of the value of libraries uh, in our city. 
Uh, in 2000, uh, the residents invested in a bond program to renovate 16 neighborhood libraries and eight new buildings. Many of them are jewels uh, architecturally. We have some Carnegie libraries that date back to 1913, uh, right after the earthquake. Uh, we have some mid-century modern that you see up on the top of the slide. Uh, these are three examples of renovated libraries. Uh, and just to give you an, uh, an example of what happens when a new library opens, the number of library card holders increases an average of 149% library cards. The number of visits increases an average of 100%. And visits, the same thing, another 100%. It really does a, an amazing community transformation for each of the, the activities. This is what happens when you open a neighborhood library. You have thousands of folks literally experience that. Um, we actually didn't tell the fire department, but in many cases we have crowd control issues because it's just a whole slew of, of folks. And this was repeated 22 times over the last five years in our city. We've got two more to go, and it's one of my favorite days of the year, is all I can say. Uh, and this was in a drizzly, typical, cold San Francisco day. It didn't keep people away. Here's an example of one of our renovated libraries. Another one here. And then we also like to celebrate by a variety of uh, diverse activities. And here you have Aztec dancers in one of the neighborhood branches that have a, has a large Latino Hispanic community. We always have the dragon dancers as well. Uh, so again, there definitely is a key question on how do you determine the value of the library and the value for literary arts in a given community. And I think you have a remarkable opportunity here in, in Albuquerque, and particularly in the downtown district. So I want to talk a little bit about the feedback that I've received. Uh, and, and again, I'm going to have more conversations, but I had terrific information gathering uh, yesterday as I uh, toured some galleries, uh, went to 516, uh, gallery space and also talk to the folks that have the Poet Guild, uh, remarkable and vibrant community. Uh, the El Chante, which was the gallery space that has poets that are not traditional poets but are now coming alive and very vibrant right across from where you have that park with the uh, urban market. Uh, so there's a lot of synergy. Today I toured the, the chemo auditorium. You have some remarkable spaces. But what I think is, is important now is a catalyst, um, some, someone that brings together all of these energies that are out there kind of isolated and waiting for a spark uh, to bring it all together. I believe and I challenge you that it could be the library. Uh, and the library could be the, the force, the focal point of making it happen. But you have to have a mindset that's a little different that it's much more externally focused than internally focused. And, and, and believe me, I know because um, libraries are sort of status quo process driven. And in our organization, we're working hard to change that. Um, I also believe, for example, uh, the first piece here is that in Albuquerque, you have amazing history, and amazing heritage. So the opportunity to tell your story, uh, that's what libraries are about to tell your um, culture, your people, and to reflect that. With the uh, digital strategy and so much more in um, technology, I would urge you to capture and archive all that you do in poetry readings, literary arts, uh, so that it's not lost. Uh, right now, we're in the early stages of forming the Digital Public Library of America, which the vision is to have all these collections and have all of us being able to access them, how wonderful would it be to have uh, folks in rural New Mexico or in other place, uh, places in the country be able to access the richness that you have here uh, in Albuquerque. Um, again, capture the synergy of a very, very vibrant poetry network and I think you also have a vibrant prose community. Um, I sense the uh, relationship with the University of New Mexico, whether it's their ethnic studies department, uh, their creative writing, all of those, you're only several miles down the road uh, to UNM. 
they need to be much more externally focused and community focused. So I would encourage a stronger relationship with the downtown area uh, and UNM. Uh, and again, to be able to leverage the relationships uh, and to pool your resources because you don't, it's not about the money. Um, one of my biggest frustrations in San Francisco, we have an embarrassment of riches and I tell that to our staff. And I still hear folks say to me, we need more staff or you know, we can't do this unless you give us more staff. I said, those days are over. Um, we need to re-engineer, reinvent ourselves because the new normal is about doing what we do with what we have or, or doing more with what we have. Uh, and again, uh, I'll finish with what I feel is, is my passion, which is developing community leaders. Every single staff member in your organization, and I'm talking about libraries, needs to be a community change agent. Um, in our city, we've created our Leadership Academy. We call it GenPL. That's short for the next generation of library leaders. And it's a cohort of about 35 individuals from across classifications and across divisions. And the whole idea is that you bring them together to problem solve and, and come up with, with ideas. Uh, this year, their goal was to have the cohort split into five different groups of about six in each and to do different neighborhood teams. Um, the main library and then four different branch communities and to literally experience going out into the community, talking to stakeholders, coming up with where we have uh, a gap in partnerships, what are the opportunities. And for the first time you have people that have worked at the main library that had never been to a neighborhood branch. Or, and you know about the us and them in libraries where it's about the main library and about branches uh, or about um, catalogers will never enter the world of a neighborhood branch. This is sort of forcing that, and the first results of our um, opportunity at one of the neighborhood branches to present was absolutely astounding of the ideas that percolated. And there were a lot of aha moments because folks understood, now I know that what I do in buying collections has an impact at a neighborhood, right? So that's what it's all about. So I encourage you to push hard on leadership development, push hard on uh, creating change, uh, and adapting to that. And you have such an amazing, beautiful city uh, and a lot of assets that I would simply say, it's time to uh, get it together and coordinate more effectively. So thank you for the opportunity to give you some insights on libraries and literary arts.